All right, good evening, everyone, and happy 2021-22 school year. Uh, welcome everybody back. This is our first meeting of the year for CCAC, which is Special Education City Advisory Council for Prince George's County. I am the chair, uh, Troy Sampson. Uh, my vice chair, Sarah Whalen, will not be attending this meeting tonight. She's out of town. Um, hopefully our secretary, uh, Jamie Afonso Kumo, will be joining us um, shortly, as soon as he gets logged on. And we have also Jeannie Payne, who is our treasurer. Raise your hand, Jeannie. She's our treasurer. Uh, Pam Talley is our community outreach coordinator. May not be on either because she has just uh, had uh, some uh, a major surgery happen uh, a week or two ago. So she may not be joining us. And we also have Isle Bello, who is our list serve manager. Um, she may not be joining us either. Hopefully she will tonight. Um, just welcome everyone. It's an exciting time for us in the school system, but it's also a hard one because we've got uh, COVID is still here and we still have a lot of challenges that we're all working through. Um, okay, I see Pam is showing up now. Pam Talley is now showing up. We're working through a lot of challenges um, with, you know, dealing with this, this, this variant out there and also uh, transportation issues, which uh, Dr. Sanders will be on to talk about tonight. Um, and just the school year has just been a, a real challenge. Also on the call tonight is our partners in the school system. We have Chanel Bowman, who's the Associate Director of Special Education for PG County, Prince George's County. And we also have Karen Andrews, who's our coordinating supervisor that serves with us. We also have our Family Support Center uh, partners, which uh, B Dr. Beth Diate is on, um, Marcy Tershon is on. And I don't see, oh, Yvette Young is also on. So those are our team members in the Family Support Center who gives out a lot of information. My mailbox is filling up, by the way, with all the information that you guys are pumping up, but it's great information that we can share with our parents. Um, and so uh, we look forward to this agenda tonight. We're gonna hear from uh, an update from our special education department, that's Ms. Bowman. Uh, we also will hear from transportation department, which is Dr. Saunders, Rudolph Saunders, and also, um, Amesh uh, Allen, who is the Transportation Coordinator for Special Education. We will also hear from the Health Services Department, Tracy Jones, as well as our Family Support Center that support our Special Education Department, which is Dr. Beth Diate, Marcy Tershon, and Yvette Young. Um, so if you have any questions during those presentations, just raise your hand and we'll make sure we get them answered or put them in the chat. And then obviously we have our questions and public comment section that's gonna be happening at about 7.40. So we'll have about 20 minutes of that as well. And then we'll be closing, hopefully in a timely manner at eight o'clock. Um, so without further ado, I will shift over to Ms. Bowman who will give an update from the special education department. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Good evening. I'd like to welcome yes. you to the 2021-22 school year for our first uh, CCAC meeting and extend you greetings on behalf of our school system. Um, I did wanna share and always thank our board members for all the support that they provide to our Department of Special Education. Um, and we do appreciate all that Dr. Monica Ghost and our Chief Executive Officer is doing um, in these um, away during um, and challenging times to lead our school system. I did wanna share just a few updates um, with you. First, to make sure you have our special education website um, so we provided the URL there so that you um, can access pertinent information um, on the website from the various offices, as well as our uh, documents around compensatory education recovery services and other resources. We have updated and posted our special education staffing plan, um, and that is an updated plan. The Board of Education did approve that staffing plan in August, and we have updated uh, the plan as well as our program locations so that you have that. And then we also um, wanted to draw your attention to the link to the Maryland State Department of Education, Division of Early Intervention and Special Education Services where they have um, a variety of resources to support parents with technical assistance bulletins. So I just wanted to draw your attention to uh, our website where you can definitely get uh, frequent information from our department. The other thing I wanted to share uh, with families just to make you aware is that there were new updates made to the uh, Maryland online system or the IEP system. On the next slide around our 
emergency planning for emergency conditions. So you know that during last year, um, who would have thought uh, the previous school year that we would have been shut down for almost 18 months. And so as a provision to support IEP teams with decision-making, there is a new requirement as part of the IEP process. So for those parents beginning uh, October 1st, as you are attending your annual review meetings or meeting to possibly review or revise an IEP, um, you will see a new component to the IEP in the areas that are bulleted here where we will be giving information. IEP teams would be looking to see if the component of the IEP can be implemented as is, if there was an emergency closure, that also includes students who may be quarantining um, for 10 days because there's been an exposure at school or who are exhibiting symptoms. So we have instructional assessment accommodations at that section. There will be a dialogue box that you see on the screen here around the IEP planning for emergency conditions and the inst instructional assessment section, supplementary aids and services and program modifications section, secondary transition, IEP goals, services, and ESY services. So we wanted to make sure that we brought that to your attention because that is a new section of the IEP that IEP teams will be discussing with you um, beginning um, after October 1st. So I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Um, I think at this time, I'll turn it over to our family support team. But I did wanna share with you that when you receive the website, we do have a special education resolution team contact list. We update this each year. Um, it'll have kind of in the first column, the problem if you have uh, questions about students placements program or individualized education programs, for example, who you should contact if you have questions about special ed transportation, who you should contact, et cetera. So that is our resolution team contact list. Um, and you'll have access to that with our staff members, uh, phone numbers and email addresses. And now I'll turn it over to our Family Support Center to provide a few more updates to you. Hi, good evening and welcome to our Family Support Center overview. Um, we want you to meet our team. We have Dr. Beth Jayate, who is the instructional specialist in our office. Myself, I'm Marcy Torshin, I'm program coordinator. Yvette Young is our social worker and not with us tonight, but in our office is Cointa Velarde. She's our bilingual parent liaison. And we are under the Office of Instructional Supports Assessment and Accountability um, with Karen Andrews as our coordinating supervisor. Oops, let me try that again. So this year we have, um, because we were working virtually prior, we have a Bitmoji office that, um, and I will send these slides to um, your CCAC team so that they can be posted. Um, you'll see here that you can click on our mission and that will take us to our CCAC and Family Support Center flyer um, that shows you all of our different services and all of CCAC's different services and contact information um, we have a link that will take you to some of the resources we've done in some of our workshops. This link will take you to a folder that has all of our flyers for our workshops that are coming. Um, they are available in English, French, and Spanish. And those are our current fall workshops we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and we also have our calendar of upcoming events. So we'll see that come up. And so you'll see we had August and September, and then we have some upcoming events in October um, and across the school year. Um, and then we have a link to make appointments and email for consultations um, for IEP services. We'll talk a little bit about the services that we provide. We do also have a YouTube channel that you can subscribe to um, as well as a Family Support Center Twitter feed that you can um, follow as well. So our services, we help parents learn information about disabilities. Um, we provide awareness of community services. We assist families in resolving concerns. Um, a lot of times we'll talk with both the school and the families and try to kind of open that line of communication and help them resolve concerns at the school level. 
Um, one of our main um, objectives is to collect, connect families with resources so that we can make you better advocates and better informed parents regarding your child's education. And then one of our big um, pushes is also to serve to strengthen those collaborative relationships with our community partners. And this is actually a picture of our office. It encompasses our lending library, some of the literature we have available. Um, we are at John Carroll Administrative Building um, in Landover on Nally Terrace. Um, we are available by appointment for computer lab and lending library. We also do virtual appointments for assistance with understanding the IEP process. We have information on how to resolve disagreements. You'll hear a little bit more about our conference and resource fairs. And then we do make also referrals to community agencies. Um, we also have virtual consultations by appointment, support groups. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute workshops that we provide, conferences. Our office also attends IEP meetings with parents and we already talked about our YouTube channel. So each school year, our Family Support Center offers support groups. This year we have three running. Um, they haven't started quite yet. They're getting ready to start in October. The first is parents of students with behaviors for change. The second is mental wellness for parents. And the third is a specialized group for parents of deaf and hard of hearing students that we're getting off the ground this year. We do have a newsletter coming out quarterly. You should see it this fall. It will provide resources and support for parents as well as outside resources, literature and upcoming events. And in case you missed us last year, we do have our YouTube channel that has all of our pre-recorded webinars and our recorded live webinars, and those are posted there, as well as having our materials from those sessions at a one link. So coming up, we're really excited about our parent fall mini series empowerment conference. We have an event for Dr. Brandy Walker is coming in to talk about how we support our child, how to support your children with planning and organization and executive functioning. And then we are having Dan Habib return. If you were with us last year, he was with our conference in the spring. Um, and he has a new short films that he's going to be screening and discussing, documenting experiences of youth with disabilities focusing on transition. And we're excited to let you know that he's also going to return in the spring for a longer session. Um, so our first session this fall will be October 14th and the link will be in the presentation so that you can register. And then we should have a link soon to register for the November 6th session. We do have a listserv. Troy said his email box was getting full. He's probably right. We are getting more and more resources than ever. And so our Family Support Center email sends out um, emails about events and resources and community action and things like that. Um, and if you ever need us, here's our contact information. Um, we are in the office Monday through Friday from eight to four. We do have an office number, but we also all have Google phone numbers in case something happens and we have to be out of the office. So you are welcome to contact us and our email addresses are there as well. And Chanel, I'm gonna turn it over to the Department of Transportation. So well, before we get started with the Department of Transportation, Dr. Saunders and his team, does anybody uh, on the call have any questions about the Family Support Center or for the Family Support Center? Okay, I'll take silence as I know. Okay, I see we have one of our board members on board tonight. Uh, Pamela Boozer Struther is here. Welcome, Pam. Hey, thanks. Hey, everyone. Great to be here. All right. And Dr. Saunders, I can allow you to share. If you prefer, I can click through the slides. You just let me know. Um, well, when we get to the presentation part, I actually have someone that's going to lead that. So if you want to click through, I guess he can cue you for that. So I don't know if you're ready to turn it over now. Good afternoon. I'm let me start off, first of all, um, for everyone, good, good evening. Um, for those, and I see a lot of familiar 
names and faces. Um, I'm Dr. Rudy Saunders, Director of Transportation for Prince George's County Public Schools. Had a chance to meet with you either in this form or others in many cases, um, particularly for the representatives who work with us on the task force. I see, I believe Ms. Newman, I think that's um, her icon I see. And um, I know you all have, have helped us before immensely um, with, with getting some progress or at least attempting to get some progress before our recent troubles. So, so thank you for having us here again today. Um, we, we are very interested in, in working further to see what we can do, but obviously we now have some things that have come up that are a little different than what we were originally focusing on. So we've got some additional issues and I know Mr. Sampson will probably have some questions for us later uh, at a later date with some of that. So what I want to do is, first of all, just start off in general with for those that haven't heard. Um, obviously, we've been addressing our bus shortage, our bus driver shortage at length. If you've seen any of the other public forums that Dr. Goldson has led that we've done for the media, et cetera. So um, I don't want to belabor that point, but I think you are all very familiar with with what has happened with that and the impact it has on all of us. For our special needs students, our comprehensive students, our specialty schools and everyone, you know, we there are a lot of things we want to do and be able to do that are impacted by that. So that has not gone away. And I'll just make this as a special plug that we've done in every setting. Anything you can do to help us recruit, spreading the word. Um, sharing that information with individuals who may be interested, uh, whether they're coming back as a second career or, you know, some who are initially entering the workforce, that's a big part of, of what we need people for. Um, obviously, our ability to impact service. But I want to make a, an additional plea for this group. Um, while we have focused on bus drivers, our numbers of bus attendants and bus aides have, have fallen in terms of people applying. Um, not sure why. I know our bus driver issue is low. Again, I don't know that how much of that is impacted by the pandemic, but anything you all can do to help us spread the word will be of assistance. Um, we are actively recruiting, while it doesn't get the fanfare that the bus driver shortage does, to have more aides and attendants to help us to make sure we have someone on every bus. And they can still take the online process to apply for that. We're still hiring those individuals through the job fairs, the application opportunities, et cetera. So if you know of individuals who would be great in that role, please let them continue to encourage. Many of them are on temporary status because when we have people who are dedicated aides, that's their current status that may change. We're looking to do some things to try to sweeten the pot a little bit, if you will. But that is an area of grave need. So um, I asked this group to help us spread that word. So without Further ado, I want to now introduce to you, so I don't take up all the time. Um, you all may know our um, special education team within transportation, who are a specialist. If you remember Mr. Charlie McCauley, he has retired, um, <laughs> well earned back in um, July of this year. So while Ms. Allen is still with us but couldn't be present tonight, I want to introduce you to our new person in the coordinator position, and that's Mr. Herb Bridges. And I will now turn over the PowerPoint at this time. Okay, good afternoon, or oh, good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> bear with me here as I go through this. You can go ahead and go to the next slide because Dr. Saunders has already introduced himself and myself, and of course, you probably already know Ms. Allen. So, and, and okay, this is just a quick overview of, this, of our school district mission where everybody probably already knows. Uh, we're gonna try to keep with this and keeping the great school system recognized for um, providing a quality education, education which ensures every student with a diverse school district graduates ready for college and career. Our transportation mission is to deliver efficient transportation and fleet services that enable all students to arrive at their destination safely and on time. Next slide, please. A quick, a quick go on over what we plan to talk about tonight, who's, in who's who in transportation, um, the tr transportation challenges, the transportation as a related service, closures and delays in inclement weather, bus operation technology and student bus information, sanitation safety and PPEs, bus staff training, transportation concerns, 
and the transportation resolution system, which you can see uh, the link there is trs.pgcps.org and also the phone bank, which number is provided to you as well, 301-952-6570. As you can see, the director, and you've already spoken so eloquently, Dr. Rudolph Saunders is the, head, is the director of transportation for the county. Here's the list of all the, the bus lot supervisors, <clears throat> and we won't go over all of them, but you should know that um, Mr. Tony Sprill is the head of operations for the North, Mr. Jacob Anderson is head of operations for the South, and Mr. David Hill is the head of operations for the central part of the county. Next. Uh, as you know, we, we, we have approximately 1,200 buses that are run every day, uh, transporting over 100,000 students. The first line of communication between the parents and, and transportation is the, uh, the communication center. They are open every day from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on a daily basis, and they're taking calls all day long. They're here to assist with ensuring students uh, that are transportation safely and to and from school. Next. Uh, the school transportation point of contacts, these are the people that we that contact us directly when there's an issue with transportation. They are usually even anywhere from caseworkers to coordinators uh, who are hands-on, who are there at the point of contact when the students get on and off the bus uh, in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, they, they're the people we contact first when we have, if, if there's an issue of concerns with what's going on as far as the transportation is concerned. Next. Uh, the two people who are the special education transportation coordinators are myself and Ms. Allen, who you probably all know Ms. Allen really well, and I'm new to the game. So either one of us, there's our email addresses as, in the presentation as well. Next. Okay, as transportation coordinators, our job is to work um, collaboratively with the Department of Special Ed to, to ensure the provision of transportation services to all students with disabilities, whether it's comprehensive or special school settings. Uh, we represent the Department of Transportation at IEP meetings, and we also handle the administration of safety vests. Uh, we work with transportation operations and helping to develop bus routes and placing students in the appropriate routes. Uh, we also participate in the coordinating and planning and the implementation, implementation, I'm sorry, of professional development for all the drivers. Uh, this was just a short video that uh, was aired on CBS this morning involving the, um, the bus driver shortage. So we can listen to that. Can we hear it? Oh, we just lost our screen. Okay. Looks like Marcy's trying to get it back now. Okay. Yeah, we don't have any sound, Marcy. Okay, give me just one second because I'm not hearing any sound out of the video either. So hold on just one second. Let's try to stop share and we'll try one more time. The share sound. We'll try again. Mm. Oh, still no sound. Okay, let me try and get the link straight from YouTube. So give me one second. Many anxious parents have a new concern right, as their kids go now? back to school. Here's a question. How will they get there? A yes, nationwide bus yes. driver mm -hmm. shortage is causing delays and adding to family stress. 
So we sent Errol Barnett to Maryland to find out the root of the problem and how the school districts are trying to fix it. Errol, good morning. I don't like saying we sent you. I think the word is you said, I want to go to Maryland to do this story about school bus driver shortages. Isn't that how it went? 100% correct, Gail. Good morning to you. Look, you know, I spoke with someone just yesterday who told me these big boys behind me are not the problem. There are some 1,270 yellow school buses ready to go to get public school students um, to class here in Prince George's County when classes resume. The issue is pay and the pandemic, with many existing drivers reevaluating the risks they take for what they make. And with schools ramping up nationwide, this is clearly becoming a problem everywhere. I'll keep saying it till the cows come home. We need more drivers. In Lee County, Florida, parents are being told to expect significant school bus delays for the foreseeable future. And in Chesterfield, Virginia, a request for parents. We're asking you to please drive your child to school. One charter school in Delaware is offering $700 per student for parents who bring them in. I work two jobs. I can't get them to and from school every day. Meanwhile, Pittsburgh public schools told parents nearly 800 kids will have to walk. My six-year-old is not going to walk here, even with a group of people. It is a patchwork of policies stemming from a lack of new bus drivers. It has always been an issue. The difference is right now, the numbers are probably double what they normally would be at this time of year or more in terms of our need. Rudolph Saunders oversees transportation for the more than 130,000 students in Prince George's County, Maryland, and says his network is under pressure. Puts us in a situation where you might have to condense a route by adding two routes on the same bus so there's more kids on the bus. Which is why four-figure cash incentives are emerging. In Atlanta, $1,000 bonuses are on the table for new hires, while Baltimore City is willing to give three times as much. The shortage is so dire in Montana, Helena Public Schools are offering a four grand bonus. Saunders may follow suit. COVID has exasperated the, the challenge for school bus districts and school districts all around. The president of NAPT, which represents school bus drivers, says the pandemic is partly to blame, a health risk for the often older drivers. You don't typically find people that are 18 to 25 driving a school bus. It's people of age that are in their 40s or later, and some of them may be afraid to get on the bus because of COVID and the students that may or may not have been vaccinated. This is easier than driving your car. Why is that? You can see everything. Bus driving instructor Johnny Walker trains new drivers for Prince George's County Schools. That's the most important job in the system because without getting those kids to school and getting those kids to school on time, you know, they're missing education. Now, NAPT estimates tens of thousands of school bus drivers are needed nationwide right now, and it would take roughly six to eight weeks, even if there were an influx of applicants today, to get these folks trained up to get their CDL, their commercial driver's license. So that would be October. Schools here, Anthony, in Prince George's County resume next month. Yeah. Errol, thank you very much. We've heard about the teacher shortage. There's a bus driver yeah, shortage. I thought about that. Yeah. I like that driver's take on it. Okay, I'm barely getting the feed here. Is, am I the only one that can't see it? Yeah, I can see this. I can see the screen. Can you uh, see it, Mr. Bridges? I can see it, but it's very blurry. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, we can. I can talk to this part without really reading it well. Basically, this deals with the transportation challenges that we just saw on the uh, preceding video. Um, how we're, I believe right now, close to 200 drivers short. And so that's because of the pandemic and other contributing factors, pay, CDL, um, people who get their CDLs a lot of times go to higher paying jobs. Uh, we are offering free CDL training um, to anyone that's hired as a bus driver. So as, and as Dr. Saunders reached out earlier in, the, in this afternoon, or this evening rather, 
we are counting on any and everybody to help us to help to try to recruit not only drivers, but attendants as well. So we need, we need help in all these uh, situations. Uh, uh, could we go to the next slide? Maybe that'll come in clear. Okay. We also, as, as coordinators, we assist during the IEP comp, uh, meetings. Okay. We get uh, personnel to review the data and determining whether a child with a disability requires uh, service of transportation. Not all special education students require transportation. Things that are considered as far as transportation is physical and mental capabilities, also, to, also including what kind of program they're in and how far away that program is for them. That would determine whether they require transportation as well. Uh, do they have special equipment needs such as wheelchairs or braces or things along those lines? That also determines that. Next slide. Most, as you can see here, most students with disabilities and IEPs, do they need special ed transportation or specialized transportation? No, they don't. Most children with disabilities are able to go to their same school and use the same level of trans system of transportation as all their classmates in their school. Uh, students who are granted special transfer requests are not entitled to transportation services as well. They are not. Next slide. Neither IDEA or Section 504 of the Rehabilitative Act specifically addresses whether transportation should be a, at a designated bus stop or from the curbside in front of a child's home. This decision is left to the IEP team and based upon the individual needs of the child. Just keep in mind, it is not door to door, it's curb to curb service. Next, non-public transportation services when PG County is closed. When PG County schools are closed, PGCPS provides transportation services based on the current non-public school calendar. When PGCPS is on spring break, we continue to transfer non-public schools that remain open. When non-public schools are on spring break, PGCPS does not provide transportation. Next slide, please. Inclement weather announcements. Decisions are made <clears throat> between 5 and 6 a.m., which must be authorized by either the CEO or designee by and announced by 6.30. Two-hour delays, when we have those, there's no work study, there's no uh, early childhood centers, there's no pre-K, and uh, no, no trips or special education programs. Non-public schools may follow their local jurisdictional protocols, that decision to extend uh, reduced school days on a two hour delay is at the decision of the non-public school. Next slide, please. This is some of the technology that is offered now as far as being able to track buses and stops. There are several of them. There's TransFinder, which is a routing software that's used by transportation. Uh, it creates routes and schedules. It has GPS with turn-by-turn -turn mapping and student info. There's InfoFinder, uh, which is connected to TransFinder, which parents can use to, uh, to see the, which bus stops their child belong, needs to go to. There's StopFinder, which is a parent app uh, with geo warnings. So you can actually set the geo warnings to let you know if the, if the bus is a half mile away or a quarter mile away or right in front of you. You can set it to whatever distance you feel comfortable with. So you can know how much time that uh, you have before your child's bus actually arrives at the stop. And then there's Wayfinder, which is on the bus that the bus drivers use and that gives them turn by turn navigation. It runs on the tablet that is actually in the school bus. Next, please. Uh, this, Okay, well. You can probably bypass that. I was going to say we can okay. bypass it. I've already talked about. Okay. 
I'm sorry. Okay. okay, student trip details for school year 21, 22. School transportation contacts have access to viewfinders. Okay. Notification of times will come from the bus driver, the school, and info, info finder or stop finder. Parents must have an email address if they want to, to get on the info finder. They have to have a current email address on file on school max at every school or at the school. And address changes have to be made at with the school register. Next, please. Sanitation needs. Of course, all the buses are sanitized daily. They're sprayed down and wiped down. And, um, as you can see by the pictures here, there we're trying our best to do social distancing on the bus as best we can. All of this is obviously in relation to the pandemic. Next, please. Okay, as far as the PPE for bus lot operations, drivers will be required to wear face covering, um, either mask or shields, and students. I'm, I have to apologize because this is not coming up clear on my screen. So, but yeah, all, all drivers, are required at all times, all drivers are to have face masks and or shields and gloves at all times, okay? Bus drivers and aides who drive the special, to special centers and non-public routes will be required to wear surgical masks, face coverings, gloves, and face shields. So they will have, they will have to do more. Okay, next slide, please. Safety precautions. Face covering will be required by all students who ride the bus. Students may have face coverings and proper physical distancing are recommended while waiting at the bus stop as well. While waiting for the bus, students will maintain I'm I'm just sorry, I cannot read this at all. I'm very sorry. I can see it. I can see it. I'll take. I'll take that. So, yeah, long story short, this is concerning the precautions we're doing with students on the bus. So, I know a lot of there've been a lot of questions about what are students um, required to do as far as maintaining social distancing and safety on the bus. So, it's the same whether it's special needs or any other bus. All of our students are required to wear face coverings for the entire route. Um, we make sure that any of our students who cannot, for some reason, be it for medical exemption or otherwise, we make sure we have additional social distancing or protective measures for the staff that's on the bus. And we do, there are some students in that setting. Other than that, we make sure that the drivers have extra mask in their possession every day so that any student who may forget to wear their mask is able to um, have something for the ride home. Um, if there are any issues with that, the school administrator will contact the parent to say, you know, there may be an issue, child's not wearing the mask, um, and try to work something out with them, but we want to make sure that we can maintain safety. I probably don't have to tell you all, there have already been some instances where students have had some contact and or been positive in some cases, so we want to make sure that the other students who they may come in contact with, particularly in early grade um, situations are as safe as possible. So that's why we have um, we are constantly reinforcing with our buses, with our drivers, the need to have the mask to keep the windows cracked, to keep fresh air going. We know that the temperature is about to change. So we're hopeful that we can compensate for, as the temperature drops, using extra heat, whatever we need to on the bus so that we can keep that um, current flowing and keep everyone safe. You can go to the next slide. And then all of our bus drivers and attendants have been trained on what they need to do, both in terms of those students who may have um, special needs, whether that's use of the safety vests, um, the equipment such as well, walkers, wheelchairs, et cetera, and what they need to do to help resolve issues with students having conflict on the bus, whether that's bullying, harassment, et cetera, so that they can involve school personnel and do what they need to do.
We have trained all of our staff in, in CPI, which is Crisis Prevention Institute. And we wanna make sure that they are constantly reinforced with that during our safety meetings. So any of our new staff that we hire has that a part of their pre-entry training. So we do that before they ever enter the bus. And then for our existing staff, we do whatever we need to do to reinforce that. And for buses where we know students may be of a, of a more critical health nature, we make sure that they're familiar with seizure and first aid training. You can go to the next slide. So I think you all are familiar with this, both from the bus as well as the school. We follow the same procedure if we get a complaint of bullying and harassment on the bus as is done in the school. Um, our biggest thing is making sure we have all the correct information, being to know who, who are they talking about and or who can we let the the principal know they need to identify as far as whether they're going to do a mediation and or contact the parents. But this is after we give the information to the school staff and administration so they can conduct an investigation to verify what the facts are of this nature so that parents can be notified as quickly as possible and make sure that they take action to keep their kids safe and free of that conflict. Go to the next. So we've had some times where there's a request for video footage, and obviously that's not something we can directly send to parents, but anytime there's a question about something that's happened, whether it's been a fight on the bus or some other incident or accusation, we can pull that from our vendor to make sure that we have clear shots of what's happening or get some idea, and we're able to forward that to the school and or instructional director, whoever the case may be. Um, sometimes security is involved in the investigation so they can look at what, what has happened to the best of our ability and finish their part of the investigation. And then there's those complaints. Um, as was discussed earlier, I'm sure you all have all seen or familiar with the phone number for our Transportation Department hotline. Um, all of, we have staff there from 6 a.m. until at least 6 p.m. Lately, we manned it to as late as seven. We've even had in the beginning of the year, some weekend hours for parents to call, whether it's a concern about the ride, still trying to get clarification on their time or bus stop. Obviously, there've been a lot of changes since school is open because we've had to take some routes and condense and, ver and change some things as far as when we pick up kids, but Parents can call that number at any time to get that information. And if it's just a simple matter of just contacting somebody and you can't get through that line, because obviously at times it gets a little crowded, um, we have the transportation resolution system, which is web-based, where you can put in sort of like a help ticket, um, very similar to what the area offices use for schools. And that goes right to the appropriate person, whether it's a supervisor, transportation router, scheduler, or one of our special education specialists to get some resolve back as quickly as possible. And then based on those things that you see here, they'll follow those steps and looking at the resolutions for those complaints. Again, you have to figure out who the right person is. It's not always um, the supervisor, sometimes it's somebody at the bus lot, sometimes it's somebody that's relevant to the IEP team, and we have to see what needs to happen in order to resolve that to the betterment of what you're looking for. We've included what we think are most of the frequently asked questions. Of course, we've had to update that during the pandemic because we've had a lot of questions about social distancing and safety measures. So we are constantly adding things to hopefully help parents feel more comfortable with what they need to do to navigate that. But feel free to check that at any time. And if you can think of things that might be helpful, please shoot me an email or let us know because there may be something, if several of you have the same question, then that means we probably need to add it there. And that may save you a, a little time on the phone or elsewhere to make sure you have that information. And we just ask when you get a chance, if you fill out the evaluation so we can get some feedback in terms of how we can improve the information we give. We, we, we have a limited amount of time. I think Mr. Sampson has been generous in allowing us to go over that a little bit tonight. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we uh, make the best use of that time and give you the information that you are most interested in in the future. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sanders. Uh, Marcy, can you put that link in the chat so that our parents can grab it if they didn't 
grabbed the scan code before we took it off the screen. I just I'm grabbed sure the scan well, code yeah. myself, so it's on my phone. But um, thank you, Dr. Saunders and Mr. Bridges. We're, <laughs> we're so sorry you couldn't see the slides there, Mr. Bridges, but thank you, Dr. Saunders, for filling I in. Bad internet feed here for some reason. I mean, okay. I, yeah, so I, right. I do apologize. <laughs> right, okay. right, right. So in the interest of time, hopefully our, our questions and parents that are on the call, uh, if you've jotted your questions down or remember your questions, we'll keep moving forward with our health um, and safety uh, or mental health presentation. And then we'll circle back because I got questions myself for transportation, but we want to stay timely. So we'll move forward with, uh, I think, Ms. Tracy Jones. Are you on, Ms. Tracy Jones? Good afternoon. I am on today. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So we'll just turn it over to you um, to go over the services that are provided with the Health Services Department. And again, once we get done with Ms. Jones, we'll open it up for questions and comment and then everybody can ask their questions about what they heard tonight. All right, Ms. Jones. Good afternoon, everyone. I am I'm Tracy Jones. I am the supervisor for the Office of School Health. We're actually gonna be talking more about um, COVID-19 than anything else, but I will at the end, if you have questions about other topics, you know, I can entertain those um, at that time. So tonight we're just gonna go over a couple key terms that you all need to know about, some of the processes that we have in place if there's a positive um, case, um, talk about some um, precautions for safety and then provide some updates on COVID testing. So let's get started with the terms that you need to know. Um, this is an important one when, it, when we talk about what's fully vaccinated versus someone who is unvaccinated. For somebody fully vaccinated, they have to have the two doses of either Moderna or Pfizer or the one dose of Johnson & Johnson. For Pfizer, there has to be 21 days between the first dose and the second dose. And for Moderna, it needs to be 28 days between the first dose and the second dose. Where a lot of people think that they are fully vaccinated, they're not because it has to be at least two weeks since the last dose. Um, and if you are within that two week time frame, you are classified as unvaccinated. So if you don't meet any of those criteria or if you're missing one of those criteria, then you are classified as unvaccinated. Definitions of close contact within a classroom, it has to be three feet, less than three feet within a classroom for 15 minutes or more. And then we have to make sure that the mask is worn correctly and consistently. In any other areas other than the classroom, it has to be um, six feet or less in order to be classified as a close contact. It still requires the 15 minutes um, in the 24, within a 24 hour time frame, And it is most important that the mask is worn, if, if we are unable to tell if the mask is worn um, correctly or inconsistently, then you would be classified as a close contact if somebody um, is, becomes positive for COVID-19. Isolation versus um, quarantine. People use these terms interchangeably, but there is a noticeable difference. For isolation, it's only for people who are positive. Quarantine is for anybody who um, has been identified as a close contact. And when we talk about isolation, we need to ensure that the person is truly isolated, meaning they are away from everyone else. They're not sharing bathrooms, they're not sharing common areas, they're not sharing um, bedrooms. They actually have to be totally isolated from everyone else. Self-monitoring. Uh, this is an important one because right now, if you are fully vaccinated, if you are exposed to someone who is um, positive, as long as you are fully vaccinated, you do not need to um, leave the school. Um, you can continue to work. Children can continue to come to school. However, you must monitor yourself for these symptoms that are to the right that are on my screen. You must fully, you must continue to monitor for those symptoms for 14 days. COVID-19, even though you are vaccinated, you can convert, serum convert to a positive, and it can take up to 14 days in which for you to um, serum convert. In addition, um, we are asking staff members 
to um, self-monitor before they come to school every, every day. Um, we don't want anyone in our buildings that um, who are ill. A mask is not a mask is not a mask. This is important because some people um, feel like as long as I have something on my face that it helps. Um, but what we're finding is people need to make sure that when they're wearing a mask that it fits properly. And when I say properly, I'm saying over the nose and over the mouth. What we find often is occurring is people have it under their nose. Um, they're wearing it under their on their chin. And people have to understand that COVID is a respiratory condition and that your nose and your mouth are connected. So if you don't have it properly fitted, if you have your nose under your nose, you are still able to breathe in the, um, the droplets from um, COVID-19. So it has to be fitted properly. In addition, uh, we tell people all the time to, to look at your mask, check to make sure they're not wet or they're soiled. If they're wet, it's easier for the particles to um, go through um, the mask. If they're dirty, again, it um, prohibits um, the full protection of the mask. I tell everybody all the time to have um, extra mask, you know, whether it's on your desk, in your purse, in your car, you know, where have you, but you should always make sure that you have extra mask in case it becomes wet or soiled. Um, we do not recommend bandanas at this time because bandanas, yes, you tie it around um, your nose to the back of your head, but it still has the area at the bottom that um, flaps open so that people can, so the particles can get underneath of it. For positive cases, if someone is tested um, positive, they have to isolate for 10 days. Now, where COVID-19 becomes um, tricky is if it depends on if you were symptomatic or asymptomatic. So if you are, if you have symptoms, any one of those um, symptoms that I had mentioned earlier, then your isolation time starts from the 10 days from when your symptoms appear. However, if you are asymptomatic, you have no symptoms whatsoever, then your 10 days start from the day of your positive test. Um, it, individuals can return to um, work on school on day 11. They have to do a full 10 days of isolation. They cannot come back on day 10. It has to be a full 10 days so they can return on day 11. We work collectively hand in hand with the um, Prince George's County Health Department. So when someone becomes positive, there are documents that we complete, we send them to the health department. The health department is the one that does all of the contact tracing. They will reach out to individuals and call them, find out how they're doing, give them anticipatory guidance. Once they, um, the person is, um, is being um, contact traced by the health department, then once the time is up, the health department will, email them a notification, releasing them and saying that they can return to work or to school. In addition, all symptoms have to be resolved. We do not want anyone coming back into the building that's still um, feverish, that still is coughing. We want all symptoms to be resolved. And there is a myth that is going on in, um, in our community that says that you have to test negative in order to come back. That is a myth because individuals can continue to test positive for up to 90 days after they test positive for the first time. However, they are only contagious um, for the first 10 days. So no tests are needed, PCR or rapid are needed in order for individuals to return once they have tested positive. Once we get, um, there is a lot of information that's out there and what I have to say is the guidance that I give you today at 728 on September 28th is the most accurate and current information. However, at eight o'clock, the guidance may change. So we need to know, we, people need to know that this is an ever revolving, um, updating changes that are constantly going on as it comes to the guidance for COVID-19. However, there are things that we have to look at before we can make a determination of what our next steps are. For example, the day of exposure. That's important because uh, if somebody 
in identifying the close contacts, we need to know the last day that they were actually exposed so we can determine when their quarantine period will end. For the date of the test, as I mentioned prior, if the person tested positive and they are symptomatic, then their test, their isolation time starts when they became symptomatic versus if they're asymptomatic, then their isolation time begins when they test tested positive. Um, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. If they're vaccinated and they were exposed, then they um, do not have to um, isolate or quarantine. They can remain at work and remain at school versus if somebody is unvaccinated. Then we have to look at um, when they were less exposed so we can determine what their quarantine time begins and ends. When we are, uh, when individuals call our office, we are requesting that they give us the entire picture because based on the information they give us, we'll determine what guidance that they, that they, um, they are given. So if they don't tell us the date of exposure, if they don't tell us if somebody was symptomatic or not, then their um, quarantine time may be different versus if I know if they are asymptomatic. The grade level also makes a difference because I believe in um, one of the slides we talk about um, children under the age of five, pre-K in um, early childhood centers. And then also the ability to wear a mask. If, an, if you have um, students or staff who um, do not wear their mask consistently and correctly, then if they are exposed, then that will also determine um, when we start the um, quarantine time. For pre-K and ECCs, if a child tests positive, we automatically will quarantine the entire class. This comes from the Maryland Department of Health in conjunction with our local health department because children um, under the age of five, they do not always have the ability to consistently and correctly wear their face coverings. And then there's also challenges associated with the actual physical dis distancing among children. Um, and so they are automatically get 14 days. So I just have a, a quickie scenario for you. Um, if there's a kindergarten student with a pending COVID test, he or she was in school all week and has at least two COVID-like symptoms. As soon as the child is sent home, they should remain home until they get the results of their test. Because we don't want individuals who tested positive and we, it takes anywhere from 48 to 72 hours to get the results, we don't want them to be exposing other children. So as, as soon as they become symptomatic, we send them home. They um, should remain home until they get their um, test results. If somebody tests positive, if this child tests positive or a staff member tests positive, they automatically get 10 days. And again, we have to then look at were they symptomatic or were they not symptomatic? Um, and then we start the process of identifying close contacts. The close contacts as defined earlier are three feet, less than three feet within the, in the classroom and less than six feet in all other areas, cafeteria, playground, hallways, the buses. We also look at to see what teachers um, are um, a part of that could potentially be exposed. If they were negative, then what happens is once they, they're symptom free, they can return with as long as they have a documentation from a provider indicating that they are symptom free and that they um, have an alternative um, diagnosis. These students that were in um, that kindergartner's class remain in school. They do not have to quarantine. Scenario two, student X is positive for COVID. Student Z is identified as a close contact of student X. Student Z has siblings. Should student Z siblings be quarantined? And the answer is no. Why? Because you can only um, quarantine individuals who are direct close contact to the person who was positive. So in this particular case, student Z sibling never had any contact with student X. Therefore, student Z siblings do not have to quarantine. 
household members. Um, initially, I had indicated about the isolation. If you have individuals who are positive and they are unable to isolate, then the person who is positive is continuing to share their space and spreading the COVID or the potential for spreading the COVID-19 um, um, virus. As a result, the individual who the sibling, the, the whoever the close contact is in the household, that person cannot start their quarantine time until the person who is positive has ended their isolation time. Because remember, COVID-19 can have somebody serum convert up to 14 days. So we need to make sure that that person is no longer infectious. Your quarantine time starts based off of the last day of exposure to the positive person. So the positive person would um, be infectious through day 10. So on day 11, the positive person could go back to school, go back to work. However, the family member cannot start until day 11 of the positive person. Standard precautions. Vaccination status does matter. Vaccination status has proven that if you are vaccinated, that you can still get the um, COVID-19 virus. However, your symptoms are um, not as um, strenuous on you as if you were not vaccinated. It's important that um, everyone wears their mask unless they're eating or drinking, but they wear their mask all other times and they wear it and they wear it properly um, over the nose and mouth and consistently. It's important to wash hands. Soap and water is always your best method in, in which to um, get relieve germs from all three of your hands. However, there if we don't have the soap and water handily, uh, readily available, you can use hand sanitizer. However, when you get to a sink, we still encourage you to wash your hands with soap and water. And we can't emphasize this enough. If someone is ill, stay home. If someone becomes sick at school, send them home, whether it's students or staff. We would rather that that student miss two days and they're okay and they can come back versus them being positive and they infect an entire class. Um, we also know that this um, plays havoc on um, staffing because again, we need our staff in school. However, if they are ill, they need to stay home. COVID testing. We started um, school-based um, COVID testing on uh, September 20th. All the school locations have um, someone to come in to uh, test the staff. For central office staff, we have um, five hubs that the central office staff can go to. In addition, we're also doing um, testing at the bus lots for the bus drivers and the, and the aides. We will begin, or, um, pool, we began pool testing on Monday, um, the 27th. And we're, we're asking, we're trying to get 10% of the population in each school to be tested on a weekly basis. Consent forms are needed. There is an online registration and all um, results will be emailed to the parents. As of October 18th, we will begin the athletic training um, testing for those athletes who are unvaccinated. And that concludes my presentation. All right, thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a lot of information uh, that we heard uh, so now it's uh, about 7.38. So now we're going to open it up, floor up for questions and comments. So Marcy, if you could 